Hey, what's going on, guys? Max here with Because Bitcoin, and today I will be speaking with Jackus, going over a whole bunch of stuff, probably some crypto, commodities, equities. We're just basically going to try to piece all this stuff together. I was uh, I was messaging Jackus privately, and I said, "Man, I'm you know I think I I think I understand the timing, you know, but I think I maybe my bias needs to be checked a little bit here." And I was going through his Twitter, and he's just got so many interesting charts that I think really stitch together how this whole big trade as i like to kind of refer to it as like it's all one big trade all risk could, should kind of roll over at the same time um and subsequently you know continue to go up at the same time and there will of course be lots of rotations and i think jack is just has a really solid grasp on how the timing of it could potentially unfold so i was asking him for some help personally and some guidance and he said let's just stream this thing so here we are so Anyways, we're going to jump right into it. We're going to pull up his charts right away. Just have a, a nice, fun, friendly discussion and talk about, looks like we're going to start here with some interest rates. But yeah, Jack is happy we could do this, man. I know we were just chatting for a while off stream, but appreciate you staying up late to do this. And uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. Hey, man. It's always fun with you. So yeah, we've been, hey, guys, um, we've been just, you know, discussing <laughs> so many interesting topics, actually. We just had, like, an hour-long conversation, and we ended on aliens, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, because of the Mexico, uh, Mexico guy, uh, Mexico alien. So, yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> let's not jump into that. It doesn't even look real. It looks like clay or something. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like it's made up from sand, isn't it, or something like, or the mud or something. But I don't know. I, I I've yeah. just seen it on a picture and I didn't really care that much because this stuff always comes up. Um, yeah. So we we just like the latest thing we ended up on was the yields. And what I was saying is that, oh shit, go back. Hold there. Um, what I was saying uh, that so many people are looking at the yields and think like they, they're gonna keep on growing forever and sure they can like the yield can go uh, up for a little more but the interest rates can stay at I, I think that's actually what's gonna happen you know they're gonna stay at 5.5% uh, uh, in US and what's actually interesting is you know, through my through my thread that I was sharing on uh, Twitter about the interest rates. So, so if you want to know more, jump into that. But basically, I was saying that all these Western economies, uh, it, it's actually pretty, you know, obvious that the interest rates are actually these are not interest rates. This is the yield, of course, the two-year yield. You know, I'm using, but. It's basically following the interest rates, right? So, so it's very much uh, synchronized. You know, there are some lags. This is what I call the intermarket analysis lag, where sometimes one uh, asset is uh, leading, one is lagging, and these can change a lot. So I use this between silver, Bitcoin too. Sometimes Bitcoin is leading, sometimes silver is leading, and so on. So, for example. This blue line is the U.S. yield, two-year yield. You know, uh, we've seen before 2008 crash. You know, U.S. was leading, then it was leading ahead of uh, the COVID. But then we see that Czech was actually leading with raising the rates, and U.S. was following. So, like, but in general, you know, it's pretty obvious that these two follow each other. If I add in the two-year um, of Poland which is like the first country that dropped the rates in the so-called Western world, then we see that, you know, it, it's basically the same. And I could add in, you know, the uh, Great Britain yield, uh, just going to make the scaling the same. One sec, I'm going to use some better color. Let's use green for Great Britain and let's scale it. Oh, shit, it was the one. Let's scale it so it's sort of the same. Okay, 
So we can see the scaling's pretty much the same. And what do we see? And I'm gonna make it uh, more larger. We can see that you know they are moving the rates pretty much very similar. You know, actually, you know, Great Britain and US are very alike or very similar countries in that regard. So their path is very similar, especially right here. But we, what we want to look at, uh, especially now, is look at the leading ones, what they are doing. So actually, if we use this strategy, you know, back in 2021, and we've seen Czech and uh, Poland and Romania are, are already uh, raising the rates, we should have expected the same from the US. And I think, OK, we missed that one. But what can we look at now? Everyone is just looking at the US yields. So I'm going to keep, keep those in. The blue line is the US yields. The, the orange one is uh, Czech yields. And the pink one is Polish uh, US yields. And what we've actually seen that the Czech and Polish were growing higher, but now we see them dropping, right? Uh, actually, I'm going to I'm not sure how, how to, I, I wanted to um, close the check one, but, or like hide it, but not sure how, how to do it right now. But anyways, uh, as we can see, the, the Polish one was growing in line with the check one and it started to drop. And what we can see also that, um, Poland actually dropped the rates uh, from from 6.75 percentage to to six, and the yield was reflecting that. And right now, it's also reflecting the same in the Czech yield. You know, the two year starts starting to drop. We are at seven percent uh, with the with the um, with the interest rates, as you can see here. You know, the Czech interest rates. 7%. Uh, the two-year two -year yield didn't grow up there because uh, the market is expecting that the uh, yields are going to drop in two years. So, But we, we see al already this one growing uh, down. And in my opinion, why am I talking about this? Why should you care about Poland, Czech, whatever? It's because they are showing you the path of, of US. And as we have clearly described, you know, they like to follow each other. And what I, ex and I was saying in my thread that I published about months or two months ago, that in these countries like Poland, Czech and Romania, the interest rates will start to drop first because they were the first to uh, raise the rates. Okay. Okay. They, this is the Czech interest rates. So, uh, Check, raise the rates the first, and then stayed paused for a long time at seven percent. And I was saying that these countries will drop the rates first, and and it's starting to happen. And based on that analysis, I, I was saying that uh, U.S. will hit finally the ceiling. It's gonna stay paused, and then the rates are gonna drop. But they're gonna stay paused, just like all these other uh, economies. Oh, sorry, just like Poland, just like Czech. You know, all of these, they, they stayed uh, sideways for a while. But if we're going to look at US interest rates, I uh, want to make this a little bit more clean. Right. So this blue line is US. Uh, this orange one or golden, whatever it is, what is Czech, this is Poland, and this is US. So what do we see here is that uh, Poland was raising the, uh, sorry, Czech was raising the first, Poland pretty much the same time, and then both stay paused. And US just hit that level, okay? And what, what I expect is that US will stay paused like this for a while. 
and then it will start to follow the others and start to drop. So that's my that's my assumption. And again, uh, we are already seeing that in the dropping yields of uh, of Czech Republic and of Poland. And I think we're gonna see the same. You know, the two-year yield follow these. Uh, not maybe right now. You know, it can stay here for a little longer, but then it will start to drop, in my opinion. And that will uh, forecast the future rate cuts, the real rate cuts. I hope that makes sense. Max. Max. Oh, Max. I think Max dropped or it's me. Hey, Max. Jack, is, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Sorry, but I think my internet just like glitched out on me. Okay. I, I think so. Okay, so I, I heard what you were saying, but I don't think, yeah, I think it cut out for a second. I was going to ask you, so historically, how, how far ahead is Poland in cutting their interest rates compared to the U.S.? Mm, let's see. So if you... Put, put in the Poland and of course where I'm going with this is like when do we think that the US is going to have their first rate cut and can we derive any signal from what Poland is doing or what Czech is doing yeah so uh, we can see that it took them about 11 months before they made their first drop uh, I suppose you know Czech is a little bit later and I suppose uh, you know we can assume that that each country is uh, going to have its sort of its own, and it's always like this with the, with the intermarket analysis, that each country has sort of its own uh, unique problems, its own unique, uh, um, how to put it, like terms at which they, they, they make these changes and so on. But more or less, the trend is the same. So with Poland, it was 11 months before the first, like since they paused and then the first drop. But with Czech, you can see that it's uh, 14 months without any change, right? So it can be around that. So if we extrapolate that to the US interest rates, just trying to get the scaling here uh, similar. We can assume if in July that was the beginning of the pause, and then we say, you know, it's going to be something like 12, 13, 14 months, then what we see is actually, and this is what I was saying, I expect the rate drops to start happening in Q3 of 2024. So I think we stay paused till then. But once again, it can be, you know, it can happen in May. If there's, for example, problems within the US economy in, in May, it can happen then. It can happen also later. It can happen, you know, in November. We cannot exactly say this is basic. Like, what we can expect is that there is going to be some pause time now. And then around this window, we can expect the rate cuts. So you're um, thinking it's the second half of next year is when the US will have its first cut. I think so, yes. Yeah, OK. But, but once again, predicting the timing is uh, one of the hardest uh, things in the markets. But once again, if, if we look at, you know, like here, right, US starts raising the rates. And then when does Czech start raising the rates? A bit later. But then we can see the same trajectory, right? Then we start Czech, uh, we see Czech raise the rates in June 21. But when does US raise their first rate? It happens in uh, March 22, which is like nine months after. And then, you know, we went the quickest. Uh, US went a little bit slower and then, you know, had these small peaks. So once yeah. again, you know, we cannot like say that just because uh, Czech is going for 14 months, that means we can say that US is going to be 14 months, you know. 
maybe because it had this slower slowerish end, it can come a bit later. So, sorry, sooner. I cannot tell this, but what we can expect is the trend to to be the same. So what we expect is that there is going to be rate pause, however long, and then around this this time there will be rate cuts, in yeah. my opinion. And I don't think, also this is important to say, my estimate, and this may be for another topic, but I think, um, sorry, this is uh, from different analysis. I think I'm gonna, we need to, we need to put a little bit uh, emphasis, or how is it called? <laughs> yeah. Um, Emphasis, yeah. yeah, sorry, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Can you actually, you can chart the interest rates as that's a breakout we need to retest now? Like, like uh, fuck the trend line. I, I think that's only a confluence. But okay. I, I think the charting here does make sense because we clearly had a trend that was going down and this trend was broken. Not just with like the trend, the, the downtrend, you know, fuck that. But we had a high, sorry, we had a lower high in this cycle then we dropped and now we get higher high. And in my opinion, if we would look back and I, for example, I, I mean, for some reason I cannot see the, the past of the interest rates in the US, but maybe I'll try that with uh, US CPI, might help. No, sorry, not CPI, the, oh. this is it. Yeah. If you type in, uh... FFR or effective federal funds rate, you should be able to see it. You should have more data. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, I have different charts where I can see that. And usually these inflation, um, you know, because if we put in uh, the, the inflation rates, they, they love to follow each other, you know, uh, so, so whenever, uh, sorry, like this, whenever the, uh, whenever the CPI is going higher, that means that the federal funds rate must follow it and, and vice versa. Uh, shit. So what I'm expecting is an up. And obviously, we see that uh, CPA is now lower than uh, interest rates, which makes the real yield uh, positive. Whenever CPA is above interest rates, that means that the real yield is negative. And what I, well, back, back to back to TA on, on the interest rates. My estimate is that um, in each of these uh, big decade cycles, is that these inflation waves goes in waves, you know, there is like two or three of them. So, so you get like the first inflation wave, then you get the drop, then you get second, and then you get the last one. And then it starts to fall, which is exactly what happened in the eighties. You know, there was a first inflation wave, there was a second one, and this was the third one. And then, you know, it starts to drop. Oops. And, and what, what, what I do expect is that like many people think that, you know, they're going to go back to zero and I don't see that happening. What I actually see happening is that rates uh, go sideways, then they start to drop. They go like to um, something between like three and two, in my opinion. And then we make a higher high because inflation will be raging again. It will make new highs. And in my opinion, the interest rates will also make new highs. And I cannot say if it's going to be exactly just a two wave inflation cycle could be because you know we actually had this one but i think then we're gonna start a sort of new age of, of this it's just gonna be smaller than in the 80s because of the national debt and so on but i think something like this is very much possible i definitely yeah. do, do expect another wave in both cpi and interest rates above this one so I'd like to, I'd like to wildly speculate on what that could potentially mean for risk assets. <laughs> Maybe we yeah. look at like the S and P 500 or QQQ and speculate what the path forward could be 
for equi U.S. equities, assuming maybe we get a pause for a year from now, then we start to get some cuts, then maybe we have a second wave of inflation, we have additional hikes. I'd love to, I'd love to get your thoughts on a potential path. Yeah, so... Um, what I uh, think is going to happen what I think is going to happen is uh, what I've been saying is that now during this pause time the equities slowly crawl above we start to get the soft landing talks, you know, recession was avoided, all the sideline money from all these uh, macro gurus. And you uh, think that that happens at new all time highs or before? I think so, because it, yeah. they need, like, we need to understand that, uh, like, it definitely does have a world, world background. But at the same time, you know, all the market participants, they also manipulate the markets uh, with the price as well. And they use the news to to to, to, to reach it. Uh, and, you know, you don't create a, a narrative here, in my opinion. You make it above new all-time highs. So, in my opinion, like, f first of all, we have all this time now like in my opinion q3 next year and in that time it should be moving higher and in that time you create the idea of the soft landing you know central banks did they work blah 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 and then because of these really high interest rates there will be problems within the economy that's that's like undeniable it will it just takes time because this was the fastest uh just look at uh, 2008, right? So 2008-9 is when the bottom of of the recession came. But look when they started to raise the rates. It happened in 2004. You know, that's four years difference. And I'm not saying, you know, it's going to be... So, so if we started in 2002, I'm not saying that the big recession comes in 2026. Maybe, I don't know. I'm just saying, like, when they start to raise, all these effects take time to, to unfold within the economy because it takes time before the mortgage, like before people have to refinance their mortgages at higher rates and before the companies start to uh, price in everything. And, you know, e even, for example, if you uh, fire people from the job, they still have like this three sometimes six months uh, leave time and so on so, so it really takes time for all of this to take effect within the economy and i think it will but it will take time and when it does they will start dropping the rates to 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 ease the economy but in that meantime i think it goes to new all-time highs Every bear that was calling for zero is just proven wrong. All these people that believe them, that were on the sidelines, you know, start believe in the soft landing. Uh, actually, what's a bit worrying is that the central bankers is already talking about like no fears of recession. Uh, but I think it's gonna even get bigger if if we get up there. And and then, in my opinion, the real problems start to come in, and we have a big drop uh lower then what they do is that they come up with qes and, and so on to, to to support everything because we are going from the uh we are going away from the free market and more towards the centrally planned economies uh government ruled economies so they're gonna support everything print money for everyone basically telling them hey you can act irresponsible we're just gonna you know help you out everyone bail everyone out and what happens uh when that happens you know when they create currency it takes one year to to start to take place within the economy so and it will obviously matter like 
which way they do it do they give checks to people again or they just do it within the banking sector because these are very different uh so, so i cannot exactly say what the problems gonna be how exactly are they gonna support the economy but in some way they will and that will cause probably the second wave of inflation which they will use for the rate hikes again but it will once again take some time and and that in my opinion will create a good um buying opportunity down here and then you know i cannot say exactly what happens but i am imagining s like something like this scenario uh over the long term so you think that we potentially have so we were just talking about interest rates and when uh when you think they're going to cut and it's going to be sometime in the second half of next year for us interest rates yeah are you expecting are you expecting equities and risk to continue rallying significantly basically from now until i mean august september october of next year and then we start the turnaround upon their first cut yeah so, so i think they will not be rallying much anymore i think the bulk move was this one and i think there's probably going to be some small moves around here. Like if we compare this move compared to this one, this was the meat of the move. And this is just to create a sentiment. It, it can happen like here where they start making these really small higher highs, higher lows, where, you know, people cannot take it anymore. They jump in then for a little longer they feel really good and then you know something like this happens <laughs> um and they will start panic selling <laughs> obviously and you know we know how that happens um i i think yes i think until and again cannot tell the exact timing but like let's say q3 next year i think there is a uh, room for for growth but not that much uh so what then, do you think 5100 5, maybe looks like 5000 5100 um yeah like okay. honestly it can go like it can just sweep the high and just go like 4900 or it can like continue you know that i cannot say i just know that this is basically where you look to offload in my opinion because this will take effect if you think like i think it's really foolish to think that all these changes will just go unnoticed within the economy it won't these create problems and when it's the fastest rate hikes in history like it's never been this fast it will need to take time to take effect uh so i think the problems will come and that won't help the equities market because equities don't like high interest rates so do you think there's any likelihood that because the pace of these hikes was so quick we will maybe not pause for as long and maybe we pause at the next FOMC meeting and then within the next, maybe even this year, we go right to cutting rates, just given how fast we increased rates. Or no, do you no, think no. we need a long pause? I, I think we have a similar pause to other economies. So as I was giving example with Poland and Czech, I think mm -hmm. that's going to be rather similar. And I, I think what's interesting is if we compare how long this rate hike cycle took it was about 18 months whereas in before 2008 it was uh 25 tw you know i uh, hope i get the scaling right but yeah it was about 26 months and here it was It was 17 months so as you can see it was way longer here then there was the rate pause and then only then the problem start to unfold so so there is definitely room for a longer pause 
even even than in the past big recession but once again you know i cannot tell the exact timings this is just approximate mm -hmm. yeah well, i mean it makes sense to look at other economies especially if historically they've sort of led you know either maybe there's been periods of lagging and leading but um yeah definitely interesting to see that other other countries are actually starting to cut already so my yeah. hope is that you know we would actually pause and just finally get the, the the pause underway here in the u.s and then basically from there i mean spend the next year i think a year is a good amount of time continuing to float up and it, i mean going and looking at this pattern that the s p 500 does over and over again it's like right there the the dot-com crash in 2000 Look yeah. where we topped out in 2007 was just a little sweep of that previous like 2000 all time high exactly. from the dot com crash. And then look where we bottomed, you know, in 2009, we bottomed just below the previous low. Something like that would make a whole lot of sense. And it would potentially line up with, uh, you know, these cuts, potential cuts coming soon. Yeah. Within a year. So exactly, exactly. And also, you know, this is like exactly where people get it so wrong in uh, uh, with the timings, because the most people are hoping for rate cuts and think it's gonna be bullish. Where it's like rate cuts, like when they actually like when they actually happen, that's bad. But for the long term, it's good, of course. You know, if you look at 2007 when they start dropping the rates. You know, and they dropped the first batch pretty significantly. We were still around here, and then uh, there there was the last batch. You know, they, they kept it uh, sideways for a little longer at two percent. Then it was the final drop mm -hmm. lower. But like that's literally when uh, it started to go down. You know, and and we see the same in the dot com when the rate when the rate started to drop. We were still trading around here. So, so the rate drops are not bullish. They are bearish. Uh, but when it drops to a certain level, then it takes time. Once again, just like with the raising the rates, it takes time to take effect within the economy. So will the lower rates uh, take time to take place within the economy. That's why, why we start to see the market to recover. You know, if the rates are low, the markets uh, can can price it in. Uh, like when I say market, I mean you know businesses and every, banks, generally the market, and they can start pricing that in. And you know here we also see the market you know actually was going up very slowly during the rate hikes. You know, if you look at the timings, yeah, we, we see. Uh, so, so I don't really see why that couldn't happen here too and then i think also like sentiment wise this makes lots of sense too because because most bears will be wrong and most bulls will be wrong too <laughs> right because <laughs> most bears were calling for zero uh, you know I i'm making fun of it but like you know what i mean and when we get above all-time high, that's where all bears were proven wrong. If we just make a lower high here, uh, and let's say go lower, that's where most bears can still sort of say, I told you so. But if we go back above new all-time high, they cannot say anything anymore. Uh, they've been just wrong. And... and then all the bulls are wrong when we go make a new low. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Everybody's wrong. Everybody's yeah. wrong, and uh, the big boys insiders make money once again. Everybody's yeah. wrong except Jackus. Jackus. Jackus told you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could be wrong too, but it definitely makes more sense to me than that. Uh, you know, we just gonna, for example, uh, we just gonna keep mooning forever. That doesn't make much sense to me, hmm. and. And the same way that we just, you know, like, like some of these guys are saying, oh, we're going to drop below the COVID lows and uh, the greatest bear market crash in history. No. I saw um, one of those tweets today, man. Someone someone was talking about how we're going to like sub 2000 on the S&P 500. 
and it's like yeah. the, the bubble of all bubbles, you know. And it's like it's <laughs> it's scary to think about that happening. I don't know what that would even look like. I don't. You were talking about how we basically have a it's like a federally manipulated economy. I don't even think they would allow for that to happen. The only reason the Great Depression, I mean, for example, back in the the Great Depression crash, it's like we didn't even have circuit breakers yet in the market. That yeah. was more of a free market than we have now. Exactly. We didn't have QE yet. You know, we didn't exactly. have all these other external factors to prop the market up. I don't think it yes. could happen. Man, you just pointed such a good arguments there because in 1929 that was real big depression and they allowed the market to actually work it cleansed itself from all the shitty stuff out there and it took three years for the bear market but since then you know uh it was it was a it was a raging bull market so like it took three years for the bear market it completely cleans out the whole thing and 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 they just let it they just didn't do anything and what happened then one of the best periods in history of united states uh but this is and, and this is what you also said they just won't let it happen and i will show you exactly where they didn't let it happen so if okay if we look at the down jones go there right what we see is this period in the 70s basically the stagflation that's the by the way that's the period of high inflation high interest rate interest rates and no growth and what do we have today high inflation high interest rates and no growth wow <laughs> uh so yeah during that time, the market, you know, you couldn't like if you went through this, right, you could have said that we had sort of bear market or here it was really bad. But if you look in hindsight, this was basically a sideways, right? So like on, on the really higher time frame chart. This was basically like bull mar like bear market, bull market, sideways, bull market. You know, sideways. Although this is the 2008 uh, crisis, but but still, sort of, it was like sideways, right? Mm -hmm. And what happened here? So so here, it was real crash. They just let the market to work. But here, I'm gonna show you what happened. Uh, if we gonna look at the Dow Jones versus the United States CPI, what we find out that the, there was actually a bear market during the 70s. It was a pretty clean one, and it lasted uh, 16 years, and it went minus 75%. You know, if we take the Dow Jones and divide it with the US CPI, it was fucking clean uh, bear market. You know, really clean. Really, and if you think these levels don't matter, why do we have these precise touches? You know, during 2008 and so on. If these levels wouldn't matter on this chart, you know, it, it's like calculation of the Dow Jones uh, divided by the US CPI. Uh, so they do, and and this was this was the real thing that happened during the 70s. The re real purchasing power went down while the prices stayed relatively the same. So once again, if we go on the Dow Jones, what happened here. We were going sort of sideways. So the assumption that you made, Max, that uh, they just won't let it happen, that's true. The prices will stay relatively like same. I, I assume there will be these uh, drops in between. Again, this can be way shorter. Uh, I cannot exactly tell that far in the future. For now, I, I'm mainly... Uh, focusing on just this move right because we focus on the next immediate move although we can have longer plans uh, but they just won't let it happen because when there is going to be a drop what they're going to do they're just gonna once again start all this qe all these checks and everything again circuit breakers and all of those tools that they have nowadays 
but the real purchasing power is gonna drop you know and we actually i think we can actually see that if we look at dow jones and here we look at dow jones versus the us cpi what do we see look at these charts are, are they the same no. no we can already see that the dow jones here retested the COVID high while versus the US CPI dropped way lower. And this is exactly what they're gonna do. They're gonna make the impression that, uh, you know, it, it's not that big thing, but in reality, our purchasing power will be dropping. In my opinion, what happens? Yeah, that's very yeah. interesting. It, <laughs> I mean, it, it forces sense. everybody to invest, right? So if we're, if we're gonna have pauses, let's just say we get our a pause soon we get our first cut sometime like a year from now and then we just rinse and repeat and do this all over again sometime in like the second half of 2024 2025 and then they they have to basically print more money to stimulate the economy um it's like we basically just do this all over again the whole thing yeah. yep hmm. yeah uh, like once again, uh, you know, thinking all these to the future, they just estimate it's a good to have this plan, but we need to be able to change this plan as things goes because we cannot see all the, you know, things in the future. Like we cannot say, for example, what China's gonna do and all, all these things. But I, I think the, for the next immediate move, this does make a lot of sense. So what we are focusing right now is the rate pause and then rate cuts. And then I've, I'm assuming, because uh, this always goes in waves, and I'm assuming that there's going to be the new wave. But we will see. We will see the timings exactly, you know, because we don't exactly know when this rate, these rate cuts happen. We know they will. We just don't know when. And then when they happen, you know, how long are they going to stay down? How, how, how deep are they going to go, you know? It can be, can be for example three and a half percent, or it can be you know all the way to like one point seventy five percent or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, my estimate is like around two point five, something like that. Would make Retest sense. the previous high, right? <laughs> yeah, it's probably not gonna be that precise, but you know, probably yeah. goes a bit deeper. But we'll see. We'll see about that. Uh, the, like. You don't really want to try to be accurate with higher lows on <laughs> interest rates. So what do you what do you think happens to Bitcoin during this entire period of time? We talked about equities. Yeah. Uh, Bitcoin? So my estimate is still that you know BTC is a digital commodity, and I can see it trading as other commodities. And commodities always do well in these uh, in these times. So my estimate is that we get a raging commodity uh, bull run in this decade. And I am assuming that BTC is going to follow its path. And since it's lowest market cap commodity, uh, it will have the highest price appreciations. Uh, <laughs> that was a bit short. <laughs> no, no, but, that's good. I mean, I just... Um... Like, to me right now, it seems like Bitcoin is trading like, a, you know, proxy for risk. It's trading like something that has a major strain on liquidity, which we know has been dwindling, even you know, despite equities, pretty solid performance year to date. I know Bitcoin's had a decent year, but Bitcoin's not even like 50% of the way to a new all time high. Well, yeah. QQQ and S&P 500 are pretty close. Um, I, I mean, I hope you're right. I hope that Bitcoin is viewed as a digital commodity and not just like a proxy for risk or high beta to equities. But it does seem slightly concerning that it's not higher. I would say that given where equities are at, because equities look pretty good and Bitcoin, Bitcoin looks OK. Yeah, it looks OK, but it's been lagging. Totally. Uh, good argument. And as you said, it's been lagging, but what we know is that it always then catches up pretty fast, pretty quick and leaves everyone in surprise. 
<laughs> and I like just look at this year. Look how quickly like like we basically had just four four up weeks, you know, maybe five. Like it happened, you know, one week, second week, we can call this a third week, whatever. Then we had this March upside and then we had this upside. But this is how quickly things can turn around. So for example, let's say that <clears throat> I'm not saying anything, but let's assume we start to go up right here. This can happen in like three, four weeks and we can be above 48K. Like it can happen this quickly. I'm not saying it will, uh, but you know, if you look at, if you look back, it can happen really yeah. quickly. Like back here, I, I'm gonna tell you how people saw it back here. They thought that we are definitely coming to retest uh, this past untested all-time high. Let me put it on a replay mode. Yeah, and it, <laughs> that it, doesn't it, look it, like it would do it. Yeah, <laughs> it looked really bad. Like the sentiment was uh, like it wasn't as it is now because now the sentiment is the worst I've ever witnessed in crypto. But back here, people uh, didn't really imagine uh, that upside that came after. They saw that, hey, we would probably drop lower, just like now many are expecting 10K and so on. Uh, so back then they expected this one or they expected, uh, you know, a proper retest of this level. And it, I, pro it I, I could see myself calling for that. If I was trading Bitcoin back then, yeah. I would have been looking that yeah and, and then and then what happens you know it recovered it came back to life and then you know one week this week was really big you know it, it was a breakthrough and then all these people expected uh that they expected a retrace lower <laughs> and then um Suppose we can let yeah. it run. Then, then it came to 6k. Everyone was shorting here. Then we went higher. And when we were, when we were here, people were thinking, okay, this is already too overbought. Like it cannot continue any higher. You know, <laughs> we have to make a pullback. And that, and that's just like, like it was so super okay. quick. Yeah. And here people really started to FOMO. But what I'm trying to say is. This is how quickly it can turn around. And it can... So let me let me ask you this. So, OK, we, we were talking about equities going to a new all time high. Could you draw out a potential path for Bitcoin basically over the next couple of years? Like if equities go on to make a new all time high and then yeah. subsequently go on to make a new low when, you know, maybe they're uh, they're deep into interest rate cuts. What do you think happens to Bitcoin? I know you said it's a commodity, but I'm just curious. Do you think Bitcoin rallies during that time because it's perceived somewhat comparably to silver and gold? Or does it go uh, on to make a new low no, as well? Uh, if there is a big drop in uh, equities, I expect drop in uh, commodities too. But, but it just won't be that big. And I will give you examples of what I think. But my, my assume is that now that as we move closer to all time high, this is like the scenario I'm imagining is that as we move towards that all time high is where uh, markets will become risk on, you know, people will believe in the soft landing and that will be passed for sort of BTC to, to run as well alongside the commodities, of course. And I'll also get into why I think that Bitcoin is a digital commodity once again, because I think that's interesting to think about. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, that in that time BTC can really run above like uh, the 48k. Like what I'm really looking at is repricing to this level, and, and that's sometime before the US cuts interest rates. Yes, that that should happen till Q3 of uh, 2024, and then when there is this big drop, what I imagine is that there could be a drop in uh, BTC from here. And again, I cannot. Once again, I cannot exactly tell uh, what happens after because it will depend how we get there. If we get there, of course, but how we get there. So do we get there in a straight line? Then I would expect a full retrace of this range low. But for example, let's say that here we break above and we actually you know, make another boring retest. Then if something like this happens, I wouldn't at all expect a retest of this level anymore. So 
how we get there makes uh, is very important. Also, the time to get there makes uh, is important. So, so we'll see. We will have to, uh, you know, we will have to put all of these uh, all of this context together and see. But I'm assuming. Hello, 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 hello. hello. Oh, yeah, okay. I got you now. Yeah. So, okay. Apologies for that. So I'm assuming that we get there at some point. We probably make a some inefficient movement here, and then during the big drop, we come and retest the big range, and then we probably like, 30, like 28 to 30k will be a retest spot where we're consolidating right now. We'll act as support during the big drop in equities, maybe in 2024, 2025. I think so. I, I think just like now, you know, this big range is uh, making a solid support. So I mm -hmm. think the same thing could happen here. Uh, and then what I would love to see is a is just an example, but I'm trying to give you the ideas to think about is that we could drop here during the big drop, but then equities make the bottom and they go really slowly back higher, just like here. But in the time, it's it's the commodities time and BTC quickly recovers. It makes this area a breaker, this distribution here. And mm -hmm. then, you know, we start the raging bull market here while uh, SPX slowly crawls here. So you're expecting dramatic outperformance from Bitcoin compared to equities. Yes. And, and the reason mm -hmm. is, you know, and I think this is just like self-telling because I I don't even know how anyone can uh, argue this because it's so blatantly obvious that it just like yeah cannot be you had a, your video on this was great by the way thank you yeah. uh, so so once again uh, the commodity cycle and equities real estate cycle they align when interest rates are high equities and real estates don't like that because if you have high interest rates people don't like to buy uh real estates because you know they have to pay high yield uh and and yeah so 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 what i'm expecting is you know if we actually look at these cycles it's usually that commodities are pretty quick while uh while the equity cycle take long time. And what I'm expecting, is, and, and they obviously align very precisely when you get a equity cycle, you get, and obviously this was the Bretton Woods for uh, for commodities. So uh, they were, they, they were, you know, gold was kept at uh, $35. Then obviously it came out of it and, you know, we see the repricing, but what, we, what do we see? This is the 70s, and we get the stagflation, and then exactly as uh, as the commodities top out is when uh, sorry when commodities top out, equities start to make new all-time mm -hmm. highs, and it's the beginning of the new bull. And then exactly the moment uh, that equities top out. Is when new bull market starts, and then it's again, you know, uh, and it's just like it's fucking obvious. <laughs> so are you? So you you've told me uh, I don't think we've talked about it yet on the stream here, but you've told me that you're more bullish on silver than gold, but we're charting gold. Yeah. Uh, why why are you more bullish on silver? Because uh, during these uh, silver tends to oh the other way around. Silver tends to outperform gold, and I think it also and it's also the market cap thingy because uh, because silver has lower market cap as a commodity than than gold, and generally in the, in the past it was a it was a sort of rule that silver outperforms gold during during the peaks. And also uh, because of the structure of the chart. So, so there are many confluences. 
Yeah. And here, you know, th this was the COVID. This is the silver versus gold chart. So this this chart is telling you how much gold uh, you need to buy one silver coin. So right now you need uh, 0 0.012 gold to buy one silver. And I expect this ratio to go up, which means you need more gold to buy to one, one silver, right? And so I mean, it could go up three x from there. It looks like almost. Yeah, yeah. A little, a little I, less. Okay. I, I don't know exactly how high. Like just just generally looking at uh, structure, this area is pretty interesting. You know, this was the sharp yeah. drop, then then the range, and then going lower. So like this area does make sense to me but like it can overshoot you know in the end this is just a ratio chart not a an actual traded chart it can but like yeah th this level you know these highs it does make sense that it could overshoot there we'll see we'll see but what i'm definitely seeing is like this you know basically yeah. 30 years uh uh Look yeah, that's this. pretty. That's pretty clean. That's yeah. Pretty clean. So, are you, need... so you're over the next uh, over the next decade or so, you're anticipating a commodities bull market comparable to what we saw maybe in the '70s when we had you know three peaks of of high CPI prints yeah. um, for a decade long period of time. How are you? How are you justifying? buying anything but commodities during that time. If you're expecting such relative outperformance of something like silver and gold and Bitcoin to that of equities, or are you only going to buy commodities during this next decade? No, I think there is always stocks that outperform in each crisis. So for example, during COVID, we had uh, the pharma uh, yeah. stocks outperforming or so, or yeah. there can be my, my, my there can be mining stocks outperforming, uh, you know, like like uh, gold mining and so on. But but uh, in, in general, equities I don't expect them to do that well, you know. So and and what I think uh, could do well is sort of sort of maybe bonds could do well right now if we expect a drop. So now is definitely time to buy bonds in my opinion, but then we expect another uh, drop, as, as I was saying, like 2026, seven, eight, something like that. Uh, but yeah, I expect commodities to be the best performing asset class in uh, this decade. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't diversify. It just means you, you should probably have Sorry. <laughs> it's... I was like, one, two, three, four, <laughs> five, five, he's back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it probably means you should just have the highest allocation to, to commodities. And BTC is a commodity. And new asset class, by the way. Is so, Ethereum a commodity? I don't, I don't deem it a commodity anymore because it's not proof of work. So I don't think it is commodity anymore. So then you might be expecting ETH BTC to break down, if that's the case, or no? Not not necessarily, because the whole, I expect the whole industry to do well, but uh, but like I, I'm just viewing BTC as a commodity, but that doesn't mean I expect all the other uh, like everything to do bad in that industry, you know. Like if B, like usually it goes like this, right? If BTC is gonna do well, the whole industry will do well because BTC is the gateway to the industry. So, so I would expect, and, and it is either BTC is for another discussion. But like, by yeah. the way, by the way, like once again, you know, this is a ratio chart, right? This is not a tradable chart. You cannot trade it. Well, maybe you can trade it on somewhere, but like probably not much volume and so on. But like, look at how clean this is, right? That's really clean. Yeah, like 
That's like a per. If that was a five minute chart, that would be a really, really clean long setup. Yeah. Stop um, loss below the low, targeting range high, yeah, something like that. Yeah. How do these ratio charts tend to be this precise? You know, it, it cannot be coincidence. <laughs> I don't believe in coincidence. No. Like, how does it make this how perfect? How does that bottom resistance? perfectly? Look at that. Yeah. Like, no way. Um, no. So, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to discuss why I think BTC is a commodity. So, yeah. I, I think that's pretty interesting because in, in the past, like, first of all, it's such a new asset, right? It's here for such a short period of time. And I think, and I understand that to most people, like, 10 years is like, the whole life but if we compare to stocks that have been here for i don't know uh, how many hundred years uh if we compare to gold silver whatever uh, or or like the bonds and so on like all these asset classes are so been forever and, and btc is still a new thing and i don't think people understand it very well and in the early days you know it was supposed to be a payment network like the, the general consensus was that people thought, like, I, I'm not actually sure about 2009, 10, and so I suppose people were not really sure. Well, what year did you first buy Bitcoin or get into Bitcoin, Jackus? 2016. But I was uh, with a small size, and then I went like really YOLO in uh, crypto in general in uh, late 2017 and 18, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I stayed through this, through all of this. But I I watched uh, BTC since uh, since June 2016, and then here around I started to make my first purchases, but they were really small. And then you know, uh, as it and goes, you became uh, you 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 got a little taste of it, and you became addicted to it, just like all of us. <laughs> Well, to be fair, I was one of very small group of people that uh, I obviously love the price appreciation, but I got into B uh, Bitcoin because I was sort of a gold bug before Bitcoin. And I understood why the world needs uh, sound money, not fiat money. And when I like, this is really weird to me, but when I see some gold bugs like Peter Schiff, just, just like be like, like his arguments about everything are 95% right. And then he talks about Bitcoin and I think it's just marketing at this point or it, it was, but, but like, he's stubborn, he's stubborn. That's what yeah. It is. But when I heard about Bitcoin, I was like, this is it. <laughs> this is what we need. This is what we've been waiting for. And then obviously <laughs> I got in because, uh, you know, you love to see a uh, number go up. But like, I was also like, I, I'm not that technical guy, <laughs> but I, I, I try to understand the world, how it works and so on. And I, I just like, like this did make sense to me, uh, you know, with, with some money and so on. Obviously there are technical difficulties right now with everything, but that will come in a time. Anyways, back to why I think BTC is digital commodity. And so here people were not really sure what it is. Then we, we start to get like some first, uh, obviously transactions and so on. So people start to think the general market consensus is, hey, it's a, it's a payment system. You know, we gonna, if, if this P2P payment system and so on, then we start to get the, you know, it, it's a store of value uh, narrative. And then uh, we start to get the, hey, it's, uh, you know, people can, like government cannot censor it and so on. So it's a frictionless uh, uh, thingy, you know, you, you can just, buy it in one country and then you can send it and, and borderless yeah yeah exactly borderless then nowadays you know you can store fucking uh, digital nfts 
on the network yeah. uh and it can stay there forever uh you can you get and who knows what else we come up with in the future right uh, like what other use cases we find for the network we just have it but we are still finding new use cases for it once again started just just a payment network that store of value then uh you know, borderless, fr frictionless, uh, uncensorable. And nowadays you can store NFTs there, you can store messages there and so on. So it has these many use cases. And the thing is that for some people, it's still a payment network. You know, some people in Czech, they want to buy houses with Bitcoin. I'm not kidding. It's like, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's in an uptrend. So people can be using it as a money. Some people view it as a store of value. Some people view it as speculation. Some people will use it for NFTs. I don't care. And some, each of them view this as, as their own thingy. And if you look at silver, so what is it used for? It can be used as payments. Yes, there are people around the world that use silver, like silver coins for payments. Yes, it's not that common, but it does happen. It definitely used to happen in the past. Uh, then it can be said that it's a store of value, right? Against like fiat money inflation. So, so once again, store of value, another use case. Then another use case, it's used as industrial metal. It's used for computers uh, and, and so on. Then another uh, thingy, it's used as jewelry. So once again, for if if like people from finance look at silver, they, they see an investment thingy. Some people can use it as a anonymous payment system. Some people just view silver as a jewelry. And who am I to tell them what they should view it for? The same thing is for BTC. And, you know, people can just view it for different things and, and it's their thing. What I'm saying, it has many use cases and then how is it so, so that's the use case part and now the how is it being mined so with silver you have to or any other commodity you have to dig up a hole in the ground and start you know using uh machines to to or people to dig up the the commodity from the ground it's a like there is there is a how is it called? Uh, like, there is not an infinite amount of it. That's why it's a commodity, right? And, and it has yeah. to be mined. So there is a like strict supply. Uh, surely it can be uh, it can be raised that you can mine from like one percent of supply yearly to to three percent or if and so on. But you cannot just like print uh, half of the supply in one year, just like with fiat currencies, for example. So so there is the limit capacity. And what is it with BTC? You have to actually use the machines. You have to use some energy of the machines, just like with silver, to mine it. And then because of the protocol, you have to, you have a limited capacity, 21 million of BTC, right? And you cannot actually, you know, just like with other commodities, you cannot uh, mine more. Th this is also, by the way, a reason why BTC is superior commodity because, but it has different use cases, but in this regard, it's superior. And again, I I'm not telling people what they should, should view it for. I I'm just saying it has like, it's literally a digital commodity and it has every everything there that's saying so. Uh, and the only way that it could be like it could fail is, in my opinion, if there is a bug in the code, which is highly unlikely as the year is progress. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, if, there, if there would be some bug, it would probably be already discovered. So so again in my opinion it's a digital commodity and it will take few years before before people understand it but that's why we are probably early in my opinion so jags let me uh, first of all I, I love your uh 
thought process. I love, I love how you just explained Bitcoin. It doesn't, and that's one argument I constantly hear used against it is, well, no one knows what it is. You know, is it money? Is it a like, yeah. store of value? Is it property? Is it a commodity? It can be all of the above. Just like exactly. you, can use, you could use gold and silver and palladium and other precious metals uh, if you wanted to. You know, you could melt them down and they have utility in the sense that you can mold them and build something with them. But a lot of people use them as a currency or a store of value. Bitcoin's a digital commodity. I want to I want to just have a little fun. Like we won't we won't hold you to it or anything like that. But given that Bitcoin, I mean, it's really it's a little over a decade old now. It's, you know, 13 years old, give or take. Where do you see Bitcoin potentially going a decade from now? You know, I know that's the uh, it's, it's something that not a lot of people like to talk about because it can be contrived as you're sort of like a moon boy if you're too bullish or if you're not bullish enough, then you don't believe in Bitcoin. But <laughs> comparably to, you know, gold, obviously having one of its most crazy expansions during the 70s, which we we went over earlier, where do you think you could see Bitcoin going in the next decade or two price wise? I think uh, there are without being a moon moon boy or okay first of all thanks for the words i do appreciate it max yeah uh, second uh without being a moon boy or or not being a bitcoin maxi enough or <laughs> how you said it yeah yeah <laughs> that i don't trust in bitcoin so um there are definitely few logical arguments to think why BTC will go above one million dollars, and and something below, but something also above, possible. Uh, and I, I will give you reasons why. So I know what you were about to ask, so I already pulled up the silver chart. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, uh, if we assume. I think this is a good argument, known argument from many maxis, is that if BTC is to ever assume or take the market cap of gold, then it would have to be trading, it, it would have to be traded at $600,000, which would be the same market cap for BTC as for gold. Yeah. That's, in my opinion, very solid argument. And then obviously you have to take in account, okay, so that's at current prices. If gold does double of that, that means not 600,000, but 1.2 million. So you if, think that Bitcoin's market cap should reach parity with gold? Uh, I don't know. I, I think there is there are good arguments for it and it would make sense. But at the same time, you know, uh, BTC is not gold. It's also, it's a digital commodity and it has all these other use cases like NFTs. Who knows, you know, like, for example, people were arguing, you know, security budget is going to be a big problem for BTC. And suddenly we have ordinals and it's been basically solved. And, and, and I believe that the free market always comes up with an answer and it will in the future. But I cannot say if like BTC is not gold and it can be less or it can be even way more than gold. In my opinion, you know, for the modern era, it like, my personal opinion is that it should take uh, the market cap of gold. In my opinion, it makes more sense, especially as the time goes. But we don't know exactly when that happens. You know, it can actually take like like the Bitcoin maxis can be really right in this, but um, it doesn't have to happen. You know, over the next two years or so, it can happen like in fifty years, probably. I don't know. It will take time for the world to really understand BTC and all the regulatory crap around it and blah, blah, blah. But anyways, this was the part with the market cap thingy with gold. But now let's assume that... Let's assume that the, these two obviously move together, which, which is pretty clear. Uh, mm -hmm. And if we look that, and I'm going to use the candle closes because the VIX can be a bit shady. Mm -hmm. um, so we can see that silver made this big upside 
uh, about 100% uh, gain. And then BTC at the time did about, you know, uh, about 800. Okay, let, let's say that it was because the, the week was the week here was bigger and it was actually uh, you know if i would take in the wigs this was 150 percent and if, if i take the wigs here it was 1500 percent so it's about 10 times you know mm -hmm. uh so with the basic calculation if we expect silver to at some point reach above these eco highs and i think that's a very like very conservative reasonable argument that at some point silver goes there um then we are looking at a possibility of you know if we take the loss and if we just assume that it ever hits um new highs that's about 170 percent from the lows mm -hmm. so if, if we extrapolate that and take 10 times and let's put you know uh let's put uh, something slower because as it goes uh its market cap will grow way higher than silver one mm -hmm. if it makes sense so, so it won't be always like 10 times right as as the market cap of an asset gets bigger the uh price moves tends to get uh, smaller and so, so we can assume about uh 1500 percent so that's about 250 uh 200 dollars and that in my opinion is very logical you know it actually does make some sense to it um that it could be like that and i obviously think that silver at you know in this decade is gonna go higher than that so if we for example say that silver is gonna go to 80 or something like that then that's 348 so let's say uh three three thousand percent and that's about uh 485 uh thousand dollars so if we are about to enter a period that's somewhat comparable to the 1970s decade where commodities did very well and equities just sort of ranged it would make sense for something like silver to actually not just go up to those equal highs but to make a new high yeah, gold to probably do very well. And then, of course, if Bitcoin trades like a commodity, hopefully 5, 10, 20 X the performance of gold and silver. Who knows? But I like that argument. Yeah, I think this one is the most logical one, because uh, like as we can clearly see, as it's it's like with altcoins, right? So I view BTC as an altcoin to commodities, basically, <laughs> because <laughs> like everything you want to look at the principles and then um what you want to what you want to look at is the scaling or the uh i don't know what's the right word for it but um but basically if if you have an altcoin uh, we can even take fucking ether right and ether also makes so let's put an ether and we can actually see that it made a higher percentage gain in, in this bull run, right? Uh, so we can see that Ether went about 3,500 uh, percent and BTC went about 1,500, which is about twice more. And it does make sense because Ether was actually, you know, uh, lower market cap. So, so the price appreciation was higher. And with alts, you know, if you get really low market cap alt, the room for growth is really big. And I think that if we if we really think that BTC is a digital commodity, then these moves do make sense. Uh, that we can see it on the both on the upside and on the downside. So where silver did 40% drop uh btc did nearly 80 percent drop right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the same is on the upside so, so the downsides are bigger but also the upsides and as we go as btc gains higher market cap these uh moves will get uh smaller 
on, on both ends. Mm. All right. Well, I'm willing to bet on it being a digital commodity. I like it. <laughs> I like it. I like the narrative that you've painted. Yeah, look at that. You can't argue that they're not correlated. You you simply cannot argue that it's not exactly. trading in tandem with commodities when you look at something like this. You can't. Yeah. And then... Um, Is silver even... leading Bitcoin? Sometimes. It looks and like sometimes... it bottomed before the FTX low and then the, the move up from there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's something I'll get you. First of all, do you remember what I told you about... Uh, interest rates sometimes it's us leading in interest rates sometimes yeah. it's other uh, economies and look at that you know if we look at silver and we understood the correlation you would see that silver made this high really quickly whereas other assets it took some more time and then what do we see you know btc catches up and then let me put it like this Uh, silver makes like I've heard so many arguments that this high was due to FTX, but if you look at so many other assets, we actually yeah, see silver. Silver's double top wasn't because of FTX, so <laughs> exactly. But but if if you look at other assets, they did the same. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't just silver. So, so in my opinion, that was, but but it happened at slightly different times. But the, the thing is that uh, they basically both had, um, so, so you cannot take them exactly one to one, but for the hair, hair time frame moves, in my opinion, this does make sense. So you had this big uh, range, mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't have the scalings, right? I apologize for that, but it's also because uh, silver has weekends. Sorry, it doesn't have weekends while BTC has, so it's sometimes, <laughs> harder to get it uh similar but like you get the point right then you had the breakdown and and so on uh if we look at just the days okay let me put it like this if you look at just the last days okay let's first discuss uh let's first discuss this because i believe BTC would have bottomed around here, and everything is pointing to that. Uh, had it not been FTX, that was one totally unexpected move that was directly for that market. Just like I said, that each economy has its own things, also each asset class has its own things. And with uh, crypto, it was the FTX that the market simply wasn't anticipating. And that's also why they had no follow through, got bought up and then repriced to where it should have been, uh, which is, in my opinion, the the reason why why we had that last drop in, uh, you know, ad otherwise they would have bought them around the same, in my opinion. But anyways, uh, BTC then catches up, right? It's also, by the way, interesting if, it, if you like, here, we've seen all the other commodities uh, start to go higher. And then if you extrapolate this, this move, it was around the same time. Yeah. Uh, if you extrapolate it, you get this, right? So so that's exactly where it reprised to. Then you, then you get the, then you get the, I'm trying to get the scalings. Then you get the March drop. And here also, right? So you get a new high in uh, in BTC. I suppose you, you get it here in silver too. But then, mm -hmm. you know, there is the sell-off. And exactly in March, during the bank's collapse, it wasn't BTC following NASDAQ. It wasn't following SPX. No, gold, silver, and Bitcoin rallied in the exact same days. And then... What happens after, right? So there is this sort of sell-off, and then BTC is leading, right? BTC goes first, and silver is still down, and it takes 
you know, like, what is it, uh, 20 days. Silver catches up, does a small upside, then BTC takes longer, and now it's silver leading, you know, and then look at this, look at this spike here. You know, we get the sell off, we already got it in silver, then we have the upside in silver, <laughs> we had the upside in BTC, and then we had what? We had exact uh, drop in BTC, and we are seeing the drop in uh, silver. That's so pretty the... incredible. Because that yeah. spike for Bitcoin was attached to the Grayscale victory tweet over the SEC. <laughs> but it's yeah. interesting how it's still moving with silver because it had nothing to do with it technically. You know? Technically, no. But we know that they like to schedule these news to support everything, right? We know how it's manipulated. So, That's so incredible. yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, like once again, I wouldn't take this one to one. You know, and I'm still learning to to work with the EM correlation live, especially on the higher time frame, because you cannot really take it day to day. Uh, yeah. But for long term positioning, I could see the value in it. Exactly. Uh, and and that's where the is... big money's made is in the long term positioning, not the choppy range trading. Yes, and that's by the way. Uh, also, when around here, I I predicted the drop for silver and therefore BTC in uh, February 2022, which is the first time I started to really crack on this whole thing. And I was saying that when silver was trading around here, I was saying, hey, it's absolutely obvious that silver needs to drop below this big range and go and retest uh, this breaker, this hard time frame breaker from which it should be bouncing, which is exactly what happened. And I said, if that happens, that probably means BTC drops below the 30K and goes to like, I don't know, 20 or something, mm -hmm. because I wasn't really sure. But it's insane that it played out. So what do we, what can we draw from that? Is that, um, I, I, think, I think we reclaim the big range here. And I don't see us going below here anymore for silver. So in my opinion, the that was a, by the way, that was a three, not to cut you off. That was a, the, to the left, that consolidation, I believe is a three month order block. If you have three month. Yeah. I don't know if you ever look at three month, but I'm pretty sure that's a three month order block that we dipped into. Oh, that that's should cool. be right there. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. cool. So we dipped into this one, into this yeah. OB breaker. Yeah, yeah. And then we created a new one and, and yeah, showed a strong bar. Yeah, so we, so we shouldn't really... go below that, I don't think. I was playing around with it earlier before we got on the call. Yeah, totally does make sense. So, yeah, that, and that supports my uh, theory too that we shouldn't really be going below there. So, in my opinion, the max pain scenario is that we drop down here, which could equal BTC to 23K. And, but it doesn't have to happen. You know, we can, we can just maybe bounce here. I don't know. I think it, it does make sense to go down there, but what I learned from markets that sometimes it doesn't always give all these retests and it's just possible. We just, oh, come on. We just sweep like these two lows and then revert. I don't know, but what I'm pretty confident about that Uh, oh, this this is cool one, by the way. Uh, that all these highs, you know, are getting taken at some point, and and we reclaimed this range, so like pretty good confluence. This is insane. So, so <laughs> this wow. is the logarithmic chart, and this shows you how, how how squeezed the commodities are currently. This is obviously the fake out of COVID. And once again, you know. Is this random? You know, is this no. just a coincidence? No. Yeah. So, so, so the where's break... your price target then on the breakout, assuming we do break up and not down? Yeah, the, the logical breakout is obviously the next higher time frame level, if we go levels by levels, is uh, right here. Yeah. But but like what can happen here is that we break out, we retest, and then go higher. And by the way, this retest, that can be the the rate drop 
that could be Bitcoin from 48 to 30, like you were talking about earlier. Exactly. But yeah. once again, we got to go from level to level. We cannot know. But like, it could be like that, you know? Yeah. Um, so, and if, if I look at Bolt, I think this is also pretty interesting. So, so like silver, right, has very similar structure, except it's more like uh, the triangle, right? So, so silver is something like this currently, whereas gold, it's going upwards, right? This entire mm -hmm. time. My assume is that we break this channel above, retest test it and go higher. And I think that silver catches up and then, you know, goes the same way. But once again, if, if we are assuming, let's say 300% from uh, silver or something like that, then that probably means just like 150% for gold because gold is higher market cap. Mm -hmm. But if, for example, silver does 500%, you know, you know, who knows? <laughs> uh, can't really t tell the upside there, but like the upside is coming and I wouldn't bet much on the commodity cycles to be done. I, I think we are just heading into it, but I wouldn't be betting on it to be done uh, until we reach the top of uh, the rate hike cycle of like this decade, right? So, so if we are expecting next few ways, I would wait till it's over. Very and nice. And by the way, uh, oil, oil, uh, the the same thingy, you know, ju just supporting uh, the whole commodities. Uh, I mean, that oil uh, moving up would potentially indicate another wave of inflation, correct? It could. Yeah. Yes. So it falls again, further reinforces your entire thesis on a commodities bull market. Exactly. Ex yeah. Exactly. It's like all fitting together. And mm -hmm. since there is no other assets and no higher time frame than this, then it's really hard to fake it out, you know. A lot of confluence across different assets. That's exactly. Sure. So, 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 so I Jack, said, I do have to wrap up in like a couple minutes here, just sure. to, just a heads up. Oh Jesus, it's. Yeah, we've been going for an hour and a half, and we spent we were talking about aliens before for an hour, so. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking long. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, are there any questions? I think this chart is absolutely amazing. I love that chart. Yeah. I love that one. Yeah. I hope we break out of it, though. I hope we don't get stuffed at the range high again. I want to see us move higher. Yeah. By, by the way, do you remember what we talked about on uh, on silver? Right. Mm -hmm. It's holding your level. It is. I remember you, we were when you came on the live stream on our show. We were talking, and you're like, "It has to hold here, or like it's over." And yes. It did that? Yeah. Thank God. So far, we'll see. So far, <laughs> we'll hold our breath. So far. So and far. I, and I was saying it can take this slow, right? You did say what? that. I've got I've got the recording, man. You called that move perfectly, but it's it's got to hold here, though. <laughs> it, it, it does because uh, yeah. But it's a really nice confluence there. So yeah, I it really no, it really has to hold. Anything below is just over. So yeah, th this one is fucking. That's that was the scary one. I remember that one was scary. Yeah, <laughs> but Obviously. we held. There. We held clearly. Yeah, okay. for now. For now. <laughs> uh, was there a little fear there in the voice? <laughs> no, of course not. No. Of course not. It's like of course not. For now. <laughs> for now. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, there's part of me that hopes it holds, and there's another part of me that's like. Let's see some fireworks, you know, like, let's oh, just definitely. see what happens. But, you, you know, definitely like, 
I'm not sure I want to see that though. <laughs> yeah, that would be bad, man. I don't. I, I I think looking immediately at the price, we really need to reclaim this level and then obviously you know this whole area and. So, so, so like if we do reclaim this, I'm fucking yellowing in everything. You're not buying here. You're waiting for a reclaim of 1860. No, I, I'm already buying, but but like. <laughs> but you're yellowing more, yeah. <laughs> I'm yellowing into alts and everything, because like th this is super bullish for Ether and Air for for alt. So, um, yeah, th like this reclaim just tells me that we are going above this 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 these highs yeah. and if that happens that means we have successfully broken from this like an entire accumulation and it just tells me like uh, this was the bottom and uh, just like it's like every every confluence so if you are I really there's a, i think there's an, a cme futures gap above on ethereum as well maybe if you were trade i think there is if my memory serves me to the there is this one up top no, I think is there one above the the high of the year? Way up there. I might, oh, like, way way up there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right there, right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. If we the flipped your level, then maybe. <laughs> yeah, most likely, uh, it would make sense. And I love how how like they baited uh, this trend line break, right? Mm -hmm. like, like sell off and then you get the big one on the classical chart where you have the higher triangle um so uh, but but i wouldn't also underestimate these two like, like these gaps are like they are not for example many people only think that these are gaps right these are obvious gaps but this is not really different from this move for example not that much different and these two are also very important and we actually see that like here right yeah. these, these gaps are very good they matter. yeah they, they definitely matter so, so a move there does make sense but um yeah it, it starts with a reclaim okay let's i mean i would even argue if we reclaim if we get back above uh you know the the pump that we had from the grayscale tweet which is on ethereum like 1720 i think we're gonna go a lot higher i don't even think you need yeah. to wait for 1860 i think it's that high right there yeah, yeah definitely most likely but like you know just if you are a really conservative person then uh or if you were on the sidelines this whole time it probably won't hurt you if you just wait for this one but i mean i wouldn't probably wait for the retest though if we break above because it's gonna get really fast after yeah. um doesn't have to but but like you know be ready and yeah. for now this is still a bearish retest so it doesn't say much and i'm also uh very very for it or um or uh, cautious like, Cautious, yeah, cautious. That's the word I wanted to. I, I was looking for uh, of BNB because BNB is still, you know, dragging the whole market down, and it's basically. You got a nice fractal for BNB that looked like the FTX low on Bitcoin, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Th yeah that yeah. could be, uh, and that would that would be, in my opinion, if we start getting anything in this area. So I cannot exactly tell how, but like, but like, probably this area is where it starts playing out if we get there. But until we yeah. get there, you don't really care about it. Like it doesn't, like the fractal doesn't say to be buying here because of, because of that fractal. The fractal says, if we start getting here, you like yeah. it has a good chance of playing out. Uh, that's where you should really be jumping in. But, but yeah, once again, um, I'm still not going to, I definitely like, um, you know, that we have af after the breakdown here on BTC. I love, I love that we have held these levels and we did not break below them. This, these support holds yeah. were very good, and then the break of this range high, very good. Uh, this could 
easily start trading higher, but it can also just be a fake out. And I'm I'm very cautious here because we've seen so many of them. And until I see Ether uh, really reclaiming this level and BNB reclaiming those levels, I, I'm not going to be that confident. But it would, you know, this was my uh, plan from long ago that we can either deviate here and make the bottom here on BNB or we can go lower and make the big deviation here. I still mm -hmm. don't know. But once again, if we go above, you should be yeah. betting this was the deviation. Uh, but till then, we can still be dropping lower. So, so technically, this is still nothing but a bearish retest. These are equal lows. That, that This one didn't even sweep this one. So there's still a good chance, you know, we drop some lower. And, and if that's so, this was probably a deviation for BTC. So, so be very careful there. Yeah. Say, Jackus, I apologize, but I, I do yes. have to, I, I got to go now. I, uh, unfortunately, we got a, well, I think we got a lot of good content. We went for an hour, 40 minutes. That's pretty good. But I got to call it here, unfortunately. We'll, we'll run it back again. We'll do another stream. But guys, thank you so much for tuning into this. If you made it the whole way, that's unbelievable. There's a lot of alpha in here. So I'm sure some of you will make it. Jack, it's big thanks for doing this, man. I know we threw this together last minute, and I know it's late your time. So thank you for uh, thanks for enlightening us on everything we talked about today. Um, but yeah, guys, if you are new here, please consider subscribing to the channel. I'm also going to link Jackus's Twitter, and Jackus has a YouTube channel that he just launched as well. So I'm going to drop that down in the description below. Be sure to subscribe to him. As you can tell, he's very seasoned. He's very uh, educated in, in financial markets, and he's got a lot to teach. So definitely consider following him as well as Because Bitcoin, and we'll see you guys next time. Take care. See you guys.